I'm convinced that God's heart is towards his people. He's looking for a heart. Scripture says whom he can fill. And so when we allow God to fill us, and it pushes out a lot of our fears. Begin to sift sifts it out. And scripture speaks toward emptying oneself, emptying, getting rid of your own thoughts, getting rid of just the understanding that you may have had or maybe the way you thought it would have been or the way it should be. Let me just encourage you. His mercies are new every morning. This morning was a beautiful sunrise. If you were up early enough. Colors are just brilliant and they'll get more and more as we go into the fall winter does God just speak to your heart doesn't God just want to embrace you he wants you to walk with him he wants you to go with as he leads he wants you to be in relationship he wants you to be able to say anything that that's bothering you to have the freedom to say, Lord, I'm struggling with this. I'm not, I'm not handling this very well. The God in whom you and I serve says, that's okay. Let me, let me carry you. Let me hold you. Let me lead you. And we started a study in James Sometimes it's very difficult to consider all joy when we encounter various trials of chapter 1. Consider it all joy. How can we do that? It's, I like when things go well. I don't like trials. The Bible says sometimes there are they are trials that are necessary in order for us to gain new strength, gain a greater depth with the Lord. We're not exempt from trials as believers. But we are blessed to be able to call upon the Lord. We have been through part of, uh, I believe we've got to chapter 1, finished, sort of finished it up last week, but we're going to start at chapter 2. I just want to review just a bit because I think it helps us get into the next chapter. We reviewed a bit about how God doesn't, tempt us to sin there is a process to sin that he doesn't tempt us but he may test us that's another subject in itself you find that in the 13th 14th and 15th adam and eve were a good example of that as they as says the woman saw was the tree of knowledge of good and if she saw it was good to her eyes and she partook of it and gave to her husband uh, just a real classic Example how we can get sucked in, how we can get pulled in to that which is enticing. And so the Lord uh, dealt with that. He, James is talking a, a bit about how we are to be a skilled at learning in verse 19, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Those three things go together. It's interesting because if we're slow to speak, we're, we're, we're listening. We're listening to before we just give, give answered or give uh, another feedback, it's, it's a skill. How many are practicing the skill of listening? It's, a, it's something that is hard to master. But people that are good at it, I admire. Because if, if you're like me, if someone be talking and I'm already formalizing what I'm going to say or I'll be apt to interrupt and that's not a good thing, my wife will say, you just cut them off. Uh-oh. So I'm a, I need to learn. I need to pick up, be a better listener. Being slow to speak means you ponder before you, you say something. You weigh your words. Being slow to speak, meaning you think through. Uh, being slow to anger, having control over your emotion. 
of anger. That's, it's, anger is not sin. It's what we do when we're angry. It can become sinful. And so God, God, God gets angry. Okay? He can get angry. But he's always righteous. It's always righteous anger. So anger is a vulnerable position. Anger can uh, produce, sometimes anger can get us maybe moving, stepping up the pace. If you're like me, I get more things done if I get angry, right? You get more energy, right, for a while. But that's not the way the Lord wants us to live. He wants us to live with, with a peace and a balance that is of joy, that is of self-control, that is we read about the fruits of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace thing. And so we get down through these verses and we're just saying, what, wow, this is kind of hitting home. This is kind of hit where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. This kind of has to do with relationship because all in all, some of our hardest trials, I believe, are in relationships. Family relationships, cross community relationships, working relationships, Church relationships just kind of goes on down through. And relationships are basically where it's at in regards to our growth and in regards to our developing without relationships, without someone that I can uh, look to and to see how they do it, see what they're thinking, uh, sort of like a mentor uh, type of person is a wonderful thing. And so being a mentor, sometimes we don't realize we're being a mentor when we're walking down to society and in our classrooms or in our workplaces. We are all teaching something. We are all demonstrating something. And so we get down this part about being doers, proving themselves to be doers. You've heard the saying, he's all talk and no show. You've heard that saying, right? Haven't you? They're all talk. Well, really, the truth about that is people learn more from what they see, right? If you're like me, they learn more about why, what you do and how you do it, more so than what you say. Yes, sir, we can teach, but we should be able to speak words of truth, words of encouragement, but that will only go as far as what you do with that. How many are with me? Oh, boy, I got some groundwork to do. <laughs> you know, this is stuff where we live, where you and I get up every morning. We, here's how it works. I have a choice to serve God or to serve myself, right? I have a choice. And I find if I choose... To serve the Lord, I will have a better outlook. I will be able to go farther. I will be able to endure longer. I will be able to be more effective than trying to force something through in my own strength or trying to get something because it's for me. And the Lord is teaching us to live a selfless life, to live a life that is dedicated to him not that we shouldn't ever do anything nice you go ahead and take your bubble baths you go ahead and treat yourself to whatever be good to yourself take care of yourself get your rest but all in all we are are to bring something that will bless our lord that would be as an offering to him and scripture says that our whole life romans 12 1 and 2 our whole life is to be an act of worship. Our whole lifestyle is to be an act of worship and to give ourselves to him. And so we get down to these verses. And he says in verse 27, which always challenges the most pure, the, this is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father, to visit orphans and widows in their distress. And it's like, oh, Lord, why is that pure? Because there's... Nothing that you can expect in return except the blessing from the Lord. And see, when you reach out to an orphan, they have no way to pay you 
monetarily. They have nothing to give back. When you reach out to a widow, they are barely making both ends meet. And when you reach out to those kinds of people, you're reaching out to the very people that Christ reached out to when he was on the earth. He blessed the children that the disciples thought they were a nuisance. These are the kinds of people. These are the kind of hearts that you and I, unless we become like a child, what he meant was unless we become dependent upon him like a child, it'll be hard to get into the kingdom. So you understand, there is a heartbeat that God has for poor people. His heart beats, his heart longs for people that have nothing, that are, that are left out, that are outcasts, that are and sort of what do we do with them in society? And God has a place for them. Now we jump into chapter 2. And he speaks toward sort of an example of being partial. I'll read verses 1, 2, 3. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Or if a man comes into their assembly with a gold ring and dress and fine clothes and there comes a poor man in dirty clothes, you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes. You say, you sit here in a good place. In other words, we know this person is well off. And we're going to really give them the seat in the house. But this person, oh, they don't smell so good. They're not dressed so good. You just sit over there in the corner and don't bother anybody. That was very much against the heart of our Lord. Because people that were outcasts that Jesus went out of his way to minister to. And you read in the Gospels about he gets to the end of his ministry and he says, as much as you've done it unto the least... You visited me in jail. You, you fed me. You came to me. That is what the ministry of the church ought to be. When we get to give to organizations or ministries that are helping the poor, are helping orphans, are helping people that are in need. We are touching the very heart of God, and it goes back to be doers of the word of God. And so every day that we get up, we are looking, and we are allowing the Lord, if we will, to help me to see as you see. Help me to see people with your eyes. Because man looks at the outward, right? You remember the Old Testament story when young David, as a shepherd boy, God called him to be the next king. And Jesse had several other sons. In fact, he had seven others. And Saul had been disobedient. He had Broken covenant with the Lord. God says, you're done. I'm going to raise up another king. And so the prophet Samuel went as the Lord was leading him. And and he would say, surely this is the one. He's tall. The brother would come out. It was was the appearance. And we have this famous verse. From 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him, for my for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And when I read that, I think, how many people are misinterpreted? How many people are misrecognized uh, because they only look at the outward appearance? God looks at the heart. Friends, the greatest thing I believe we can give to our Lord is our heart. 
You give to him your heart. You don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to have all the scriptures understood. You simply believe Jesus. And you ask to invite him into your heart. That's where it starts. I'm so glad that he, he sees your heart today. When, when you've been misinterpreted, when you have been misunderstood, when you have maybe had people throw things at you that are not true, that you never said, and on and on it goes. There are so many trials that has to do oftentimes in the relational way. But God is the one who sees your heart today. And when you're honest before the Lord, your heart can be free. Your heart can f begin to fly and soar. You can rise above because God has your heart. And God has your heart. It's settled. As the song went, it is well with my soul. How does it become well with our soul? It becomes well with our soul when we're squared up, when we're br brutally honest before the Lord and say, here's my heart. Even in my brokenness, even in my unbelief, even in my discouragement, God comes to fill our heart. And so the writer James is referring to probably something that happened in this very thing that he, he was observing what was happening. See, the church needs to be a safe place for people to come. Well, we, what, what I've enjoyed watching you guys is you, people come in, you're there to greet them, you're there to uh, engage in conversation and touch and reach out. That's a wonderful thing. Keep it up. And we're uh, all people. We are all people in need. We're all saved by the grace of God. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And God has come to people that doesn't, does not matter what, what tribe, tongue, or nationality, what, whatever it is, whatever background, whatever you've done, God's grace is sufficient for you and I. Love how he says in verse 9, if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law of trans. But whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of it all. In other words, none of us are exempt from sin. But by the grace of God, we are saved so that we can do the works he has called us to. So number one, he is, uh, doesn't show partiality. He doesn't show favoritism. He doesn't love one more than the other. And God loves people, period. And his heart breaks. He's longing that whosoever will believe in him shall not perish. That none should be lost without him in all eternity. Secondly, this whole idea of faith being carried out, being demonstrated being uh, lived out, being completely, uh, that's who you are. And we have illustrations throughout Scripture. Remember the Good Samaritan who sees this man lying broken and beaten and robbed. And a couple other folks, the religious people, so to speak, were just didn't have the time, but this Good Samaritan Take him, uh, I'll pay for his room, I'll pay, uh, I'll take care of him. And he reached out to him. That's exactly what the Lord Jesus did for you and I. When we were broken, when we were not able to save ourselves. First John chapter 3, verse 17 and 18 reads, But whoever has the world's goods, and behold, the brother need and does, and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in Indeed and in truth. Oh, how fun it is to help people, to help them maybe behind the scene, giving something without them knowing it. That is so fun. Harry and I tried this once. Well, we were at our other, another church. At first, I mean, this is our second church, by the way. The, our first church is a community in Palisade in nine years. And, um, we said we decided we're going to try this. We're going to we're going to pay for 
a pastor. We, we picked one. We picked a pastor couple out. We're going to go ahead of time. We're going to pay for their, their way to ministers uh, seminar. And then when we did that, we just we just we kind of just watched in the corner. We didn't we didn't make eye contact. We just observed and to see their face drop. Like what? You see, if you see a brother in need, and if you have the means to help, when we do it, it's some of the greatest ways of being able to rise above and feel like you've accomplished something, that you've made a difference. And you don't have to be money. It can be that person that just needs a listening ear. Maybe there's someone that you know that really could use a hug or a note or a good hearty handshake and just say, I appreciate you. The church ought to be a place where we are there for each other because we are going through so many similar things that we are in this so-called battle, battle that is in the spiritual realm and that I need to be careful that I do not try to just kind of Forget about everybody else during the week, but to be on a conscious effort to hold people up in prayer or make an effort to reach out to them. What a difference it makes. You see, how many of you have been touched by someone who remembered your birthday or remembered something significant in your life? You said, I remember, and I was thinking about you. It makes your day, right? And God is looking for people who will live out his word that it would demonstrate over and over again that we will be the people of God who has kindness, a warmth, a sensitivity, a respect, a hospitality that goes beyond. You know, waiters and waitresses have ever observed is a stress job, right? Especially if the place is packed and it's an opportunity for you and I to say, good job, I know you're busy and you're doing a good job. Try that sometime. Oftentimes it's this, can you get, can you, can you do, can, you know, already things are stacked and we, 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 want, we want more, right? Be sensitive. It may lead to opportunity to present the love of God. How many have a business or you've had a business and you, it's been demanding or you work in a place where it's demanding sometimes you're spent, right, so to speak? And it's just like if somebody asked me to do one more thing, I'm not going to be able to handle it, right? Right? How many of you remember when your kids were little and you remember back and you don't know how you made it, right? Or you just came off a week with some beautiful grandkids. I mean, yeah, Joe, you're sticking out. And I could tell he, he was a joy, but he spent. Why? Because he loves. You see, it takes energy to love and serve and keep strong but don't I, I would say this it's hard to be real especially with other believers does that make sense but we ought to be real we should be able to be real but you know what I've just been spent this week. I've just been through a hard week. You know what? That's, that's not being, that's not a lack of spirituality. That is a letting people in so that they can come alongside and bear your burden with you. 
if you see your brother in need, but how do you know if sometimes you don't know there's a need? And sometimes we got to let down the walls and say there's a need. Life is not always that which it appears to be. Sometimes it seems like there are people, well, I wonder if they ever have a bad moment. Come on. Yeah? I'm sure they have their moments. Everyone has their moments. And so when we look at trials, when we look at the testing, we think, how, how can we make the most of this? How are we supposed to respond? And many times I think I'm convinced that it's not how we respond, on necessarily it's just who we cling to and I don't always have the fix it I don't have to always try to make people happy I mean I can try but God is the only one that can fulfill the inner man God is the only one that can mend brokenness and pain of loss or something that is tremendous to walk through. See, it's the same grace that saved you that will keep you. The grace, grace, by grace we have been saved through faith. It is the gift. It is not a result of the works that we should boast. In other words, I can't work hard enough to be good enough. I cannot sort of outweigh my bad by doing good to somehow say, Lord, now look at me. Now you can accept me. God is saying, Come as you are. I know you're broken. And I will make you what you ought to be. Stop trying to earn your way to me. And now when we figure that out with the Lord's help, by his grace, he saves us. And now because we, he saved us, he gives us a new heart. He gives us a new mindset. All of a sudden, you begin, you begin to sense that God has something, a purpose for you now. You have some, a reason to live. You have someone else that God wants you to touch and bless. And so I say at this, Ephesians talks about it. We're not saved. We're not saved by works. We're saved unto. Unto. We're saved and now we want to good, be doing good things. Does that make sense? I don't know if that was the proper. Steve and I were talking about this very thing. Not to say, does that make sense? I don't know what you said. I see, I already forgot. I wasn't listening good enough. <sighs> How can we? Here's what I've. I'm trying to say, them, some things are more caught than taught. You catch the spirit of a person. You catch the spirit of Jesus. You, some people feel Jesus and they're not sure what to do with it. And so many times he's just saying, I am with you. I want you to come closer. We're going to work on things. I have great and mighty things planned for you. I have a future planned for you. I know the plans, Jeremiah says. I know the plans. I know the plans to make you what you ought to be. I know what it takes to bring you to a place where you are completely mine. God is working on us. He doesn't want you to be off by yourself all alone. He's never intended for you to walk this life all by yourself. He's wanting 
people in your lives together through relationships, through a walk together with God because he works by his spirit. And so we see this in James. He closes out this chapter. And it's very thought. It almost seems conflictive with Paul a little bit about, you know, we're saved not by works. Well, James is saying, verse 14 of chapter 2, what use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith but has no works, can that faith save him? There's just, oh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What is he saying? He goes on to illustrate of a brother or sisters without clothing and in need of daily food, and one you says to them, go in peace, and I'll give you a classic. God bless you, and that's okay. But if they had a need and you knew about it and you could do something about it, what is James saying, then, then do it, and that will really bless that will make the difference to the Lord and to the situation. And so what he's saying, if even so faith, if it has no works, is dead. What is he saying? Now that I have Christ in my life, I want to do something of value. I want to make a difference. I want to reach out and serve because it is that of the heart of God. And so I'm going to leave you with this. If you look at 18 and 19 and you wonder, what is he, what is he getting at? What is he saying? Well, he's making the point. Someone may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works. I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe in shudders. So what did you say? Christianity is more than head knowledge. That's what he's saying. Let's boil it down. Christianity is more than head knowledge. It's heart. And everyone has a heart. Somewhere in your heart, you either let God in or you don't. And what God's longing for is to come into your heart. And when he does that, he squares up. All of a sudden, you have a, l- a lift. You're lighter. Your soul begins to soar. You begin to feel free. You're forgiven. You're not, you're not drugged down. You're not condemned. You're you're able to come to God. You begin to pray, oh, Lord. I don't want to just go through the motions. And I believe you're here today because you don't want to go through the motions. You go through the motions, you find yourself empty and dry. You find yourself burnt out. You find yourself empty, just spent. Because the God of the universe looks down and sees your heart today. He longs to be in the center, be on the seat of your heart. Can we just take a moment and say, Lord, dwell in my heart. Dwell in me, Lord. Come into my heart afresh and anew, whether you've asked him in your heart before or not. Maybe it's the first time. That's great. Say, Lord, if you're willing, Lord, come into my heart. I know you're willing. We don't even have to ask that because you are willing. And slow, if you pray that prayer, Lord, help us to believe that. We will no longer have to do it on our own. Try to make an impression on people. It's not what it's all about. It's simply to be surrendered. Lord, kindle that flame that Paul talked about. Kindle the flame. 
stir up, he said, stir up to, to a young man named Timothy, stir up the gift of God. In other words, we are, ten, we are to tend to the fire on our heart. The Old Testament, we have the Old Testament priests, and they were always to keep the fire going on the altar. And that's our responsibility. I'm going to sing this song in closing. Let's stand, if you will, please.